know, I know those sides take a lot of work, but it yeah. looks good. Uh, good. You know, I like it. You know, uh, yeah, it just looks. It looks good. It seems really. Uh, there's a lot of information, a lot of links you've uh, embedded in there, and uh, yeah, kudos to you. Good. I'm glad you like it. So it to work uh, well for you, and you get a lot of traffic too. I got well, I'm trying to keep it small. So like. Like I was saying a second ago, we're going to put a password on the website. It's going to be just for the five of us. Um, and we're going to continue recording and releasing the determinism lectures and then probably stop releasing things and just record them and put them in the website. But uh, this, the bibliography is ready to go in this section and we'll be doing it for every other section after it as well. And so these are, you know, basically the launch point for your research moving forward. Uh, once it's all finished, but we got a lot done this week. Can I? Uh... Can, all right. So let's get into, let's turn this off. It's already off. Go ahead. I can't hear you. Hello? Oh, yeah. No, I had a, no, I got speaker issues. I just took the Bluetooth back up. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Hey, so the one thing I would say, which isn't a uh, criticism so much as what I like to see, right? I like, you know, uh, yep. th there's a lot of information on here. There's a lot of scrolling involved. And uh, the more menus you get on the left-hand column there that, that are linkable to, uh, well, I don't know. I, I'm not trying to sound um, uh, like a dick or anything. Sounds fine. I'm not, but, but no, I'm just like, my my prehistoric brain just wants uh, like all these links on the left for some reason it could be just me uh, i thought i just mentioned sure. it yeah just trying to be helpful in a way. No, that makes, no that makes sense i so i changed it i had to put each subject on a different page because it was just too much for one page i used to have links on the left that would help you navigate and know where you are with things to new pages they all stop working yeah, but i'll work on wrong. Hey, don't get me wrong. It looks fantastic, and I can see that you. Put I'll a lot probably of work. work on. I'll probably work on making sure there's a, a way of navigating it more easily. But at least now you'll know where the determinism is. When we go to mind and body, you'll be able to click on that, and and it'll be its own page, and it'll look like this. So I'll, I'll keep working on it. All right, let's talk about Schlick. When is man responsible? Oh my. Let's see what his answer is here. I can close out of this. Was there anything else I wanted to talk about here? Books linked to places where you can buy the book, the JSTOR links, faces and pics are also links. Like I said, text is also, all right, that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about. Okay, good. Great. And I showed you all the bibliography stuff to launch your research. So let me close out of that. All right, good. Let's actually get into it now. Okay, so Lauren, go lay down. So you guys, uh, you you listened to the reading or you did the reading. So let's talk about Schlick. The only reason this question is a problem in ethics is because he says of a misunderstanding. So we already know he's a compatibilist, right? He's saying we think that there's a conflict between determinism and liberty, but there's not. We're just making a misunderstanding. He says the problem runs like this: quote, if determinism is, is true. If, that is, all events obey immutable laws, then my will is also always determined by my innate character and by my motives. Hence, my decisions are necessary, not free. But if so, then I am not responsible for my acts. For I would be accountable for them only if I could do something about the way my decisions went. But I can do nothing about it since they proceed with necessity from my character, and from the motives. And I have made neither of these things and have no power over them. The motives come from without, and my character is the necessary product of the innate tendencies and the external influences which have been effective during my lifetime. Thus, determinism and moral responsibility are incompatible. Moral responsibility presumes freedom, or I'm sorry, moral responsibility presupposes freedom, that is exemption from causality, right? So he's just setting up the normal setup. He says, if, determ if determinism, no free will. And he's saying, so you can either have free will and no determinism, or you can have determinism and no free will, but you can't have them both. That's what everybody believes. 
he thinks that we're mistaken. This is all based on a confusion which runs throughout. We should expose that confusion, see how it runs throughout the argument, and thus destroy them, destroy the confusion. So we've already seen a similar move like this, or a similar category of move twice now. Mill said, hey, there's a confusion. There's no problem between these two things. And the confusion is with causality. You believe in a principle of causality. You think it implies compulsion, and it doesn't. So therefore, there's no problem for your freedom, even if everything's determined. And we looked at Lewis, who I believe said, uh, yeah, this is a, this is a confusion. Uh, we're misusing the term responsible. And I'm trying to remember his argument right now. Can somebody remind me? This was two classes ago. I'm just trying to remember what was Lewis's argument. Let's scroll up here a second and just see. Ah, okay, here we are. So Lewis says, law and morality are not the same. Da, 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 da. I remember that. Deterrence is justifiable. What was the main point of his argument, though? Oh, special freedom. We have a, we have a freedom of choice when we have absolute choice, right? So he says, yeah, okay, so that's not even as convincing. So let's scroll back down here and get back into Schlick. So um, Lewis had said, look, we've got a, we're misunderstanding freedom. Let me explain. Uh, you, you want there to be determinism. You're not responsible unless it makes sense the way you're acting and that it could be predictable. But look, I'll show you how your moral responsibility is this part of your actions, and it only happens in this type of situation. So we've seen two compatibilists so far. We've seen Lewis and we've seen Mill, both very, very different kinds of arguments. And now we're going to see Schlick, who has a very the same category of argument. But what he's going to say is, it's not like Mill said, where we misunderstand what causality means. It's that we misunderstand what law means for moral responsibility, in a sense. So let's see. The entire problem arises from this confusion. Natural law and man-made laws have one thing and one thing only in common that they are expressed formulaically. That's the only right formula. We've been saying this a lot. The deterministic laws of physics that don't stop at your skull, those are formulas. They're descriptors. They're formulaic. He says that's formula. It says, you know, A and then B. A false equivocation occurs then from this one word. Man-made laws have compulsory elements, punishments, and are about how we should behave. Natural laws are just descriptions of the regularities of the world. Okay? That's very much like what Mill said. When we say that a man will, that a man's will obeys psychological laws, like the physical laws that govern objects bumping into each other, maybe there are psychological laws that govern why a man wants something and what he will choose. But we're saying he it obeys that law. Doesn't that mean that he isn't free? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to add you here. Doesn't that mean he's not free? He says, no, that's two different ideas of law. The one idea of law is just a formulaic description of if X is there, then Y will happen. It doesn't mean that the law is making X force Y to happen. It just means this is, you know, very much like milk. But, but we say, you know, if there's psychological laws that can describe why a man wants something and what he will choose given different circumstances and his character, doesn't that mean he has to do it? No, that's a descriptor. It's not that kind of law. No compulsion here. These are not civic laws which compel him to make certain decisions or dictate desires to him, which he would, in fact, prefer not to have. They are laws of nature merely expressing it's descriptive, merely expressing which desires he actually has under given conditions. They describe the nature of the will in the same manner as the astronomical laws describe the nature of planets. Compulsion occurs where man is prevented from realizing his natural desires. How could the rule according to which these natural desires arise itself be considered as compulsion? Okay. Let's, let's pause there for a second and see what he just did. 
What he just said was, if this is a law, like the laws of physics that govern objects following elliptical paths through space or billiard balls bumping into each other and conserving momentum as that you predict what angle they'll fly away from each other at given a specific setup. If the laws are like that, all the laws are doing are saying, oh, this kind of a guy in this kind of a situation will want this kind of a thing. It's, it's basically always right. And if it was always right, it isn't making anything happen. It's describing everything. Okay, now this might be convincing, it might not be convincing, but here's here's the real point of his argument here, is that this is just descriptive, this type of type of a law. But because in the legal sense of law, we mean compulsion, right? It, it's like, oh, are the planets wishing to go somewhere else, but the law forces them to obey? No, they always go like that. Then we call it a law. But we call it a law when they always do it. A human law with compulsion is breakable. That's what proves that it's there in the first place, is that you're trying to make something happen against the natural inclinations. But this other law is always pro whatever the natural inclinations are, just as much as it could be against it. Because all it is is saying this is what they are, right? It's descriptive. It's saying this is what it is, not it shall be like this. Okay, we get the idea, I think. So he has a section called Compulsion and Necessity. <laughs> what he's going to do now, he's going to take five different or six different sets of words. He's going to say, this word means this in the context of morality, determinism, and free will. But it means this in another context. And we just keep confusing them. So I'm going to clarify each one of these terms. The first confusion, the one we just talked about, translates itself into the second to say that something is necessary has to happen when talking about natural law is to say this rule applies in all circumstances or to say that it is universally valid or applies always. That's what the word necessary means in the context of these universal laws like causality and determination. That's all it means is that this is such a general understanding that it always applies. And, and if you forget about it, you're going to get lost because it's powerful and useful, but it applies everywhere is all it means. That's what necessary means in this context. To say that behavior is necessary is to say that it is compelled. You have to do this. You need to do this, right? That means you won't always do it, right? By definition, it's not the same kind of ne necessary that we mean when we're using necessary in the earlier context. Because of the confusion of these very different ideas, simply because of an equivocation in the language, we have this pseudo problem. What pseudo problem? The original formula. If determinism, no free will. If free will, you must not be determinism. That whole thing only exists, he says, as a pseudo problem. It's not real. It's because we're confusing our language. Mill said the same thing. He said it was the worst confusion of language in all of philosophy. All right, freedom and indeterminism. Now, so he's saying to the determinists, look, you're messing up here. You think when you said law, you thought the planets were obeying against their will. The law isn't like that, this kind of law. Now he's going to turn to the libertarians, those metaphysical libertarians that Mill was criticizing. And he's going to say, you guys are doing the same thing. He's going to say, what about freedom and indeterminism? You, you want freedom so badly that you want to break the general law of being? Oh, the laws of physics cease to exist at my skull. The universal causality doesn't work here. Is that really what you want? You want to be in a total chaos of insanity? Because that's not freedom. That's not you choosing. That's who could possibly predict. It's wild, right? So here's what he says. If we could just keep clear the two ideas... We would understand that moral concerns require us to affirm the kind of freedom of choice a man has for his decisions. And we will see no threat to that idea from a regularity of emergence of his impulses or desires. The second does not threaten the first because they are about two completely different things. Now, this is interesting. He makes a very interesting point here. He says, 
if we really understood freedom the way we want it, the thing that's compelling the libertarians to say, no, determinism must be false. I am free. I am free. If they knew what determinism really was, they would say, I need determinism to be true. Determinism has to be true because otherwise I'm not free. I'm just random and weird. It has to make sense why I'm doing what I'm doing. Why did I do what I do? Well, I felt like doing this, but I was educated to know my duty was that. And so it's predictable that a man of my character might do the right thing in this circumstance. If there's no determinism to explain it and make it predictable, how can anyone trust you? How could you understand? Hey, the ax murderer who's been killing people for 30 years, he might become a great benefactor of humanity tomorrow because who knows why he does what he does. No, you need determinism to be morally responsible and to have freedom, says, says Schlick. So the same confusion poisons the minds of the determinists, but it also poisons the minds of the indeterminists as well. And he points that out this way. He says, let's look at the nature of responsibility. The ethical question, oh, sorry, one second. The ethical question is concerned with this and only this. Where is the point of motive? Punishment and reward, incentive and compulsion, the things of moral law, different and totally distinct from regularity of causal events. That's that, uh, that's that universal kind of law. It's not what we mean, which has nothing to do with the ethical question at all. This must be applied to the specific person who embodies the motive, which leads to the action we deem worthy of reward or punishment in the hopes of deterring or incentivizing future occurrences of that event. So here's an interesting idea from Moritz. He's going to expand on this in a moment. But basically what he, he decides is this. He says, look, we want to call some things bad. We want to call some things good. We think it would be wise to punish bad things so that they're less likely to happen in the future, which only makes sense if determinism is true. And you could predict that having consequences would make someone actually choose the other way. Right. And we and to praise and, and, and you know, give praise and reward to people who do things that we want to see more of and things like that. You know, so why? He says, let's think about it this way. The action is the thing that we like or hate and we're trying to promote or eradicate. And it's right for us to put our emphasis and our attention on whoever possessed the motive to make that action happen. So he's going to give an example. He's going to say, look, if you go rob a bank at the point of a gun and you terrorize people and you cause dangerous situations to happen so you can greedily take some money that you're too stupid or lazy to work for or whatever. If you go do that, we think, oh, you are motivated to do something that's going to really ruin our ability to trust each other and know that our money's safe and continue doing all the things that civilization produces. We think the action you did is bad. And I think I know why you did it. You did it because you wanted to. You, you were the one motivated to do it. So you're the one we're going to punish. Fine. But if somebody kidnaps my family and sends me a ransom note that says, go to this bank and rob this bank and take out all the money and give me the money because I've got your wife and kids at the point of a gun, we say, boy, the action we want to prevent here is the robbing of a bank. We think robbing banks is really bad. We also want to prevent kidnapping as well, but let's just focus on the robbing of the bank. So we say we want to have fewer bank robberies. So let's go and pay attention to the man who was motivated to make this happen. You were compelled to make it happen. If you kidnap, if someone kidnaps your family members and then you go do this horrible act, we don't think about punishing you. We look at the person who motivated it all, the one who possessed in themselves the motivation to make this action happen. And it's right that we do so because we understand that determinism has nothing to do with compulsion and that the regularity of, of behavior is probably understandable in some sense eventually. And so let's go punish the guy that did the kidnapping and make sure he doesn't do this again. And we deter other people from doing it. So he says it's all focuses on motive. Let's figure out where the motive is. And if you believe in determinism and you really are a hard determinist, you believe the big bang motivated my actions today. Well, that's not useful because that's so, even if it was true, it's like a billionth of the motive was contained in all sorts of particles and factors of the big bang. I can't punish the big bang. I can't shape the big bang. I look at where the motive is embodied and it's right that I do so because moral responsibility is very reasonable. I want these actions to happen more often. I want these to happen less often. Let's find the guy making the action happen and deal with him accordingly. 
Um, and all of that depends, he says, on the universal kind of determinism. And that universal kind of determinism has no compulsion in it at all. There, you know, like we said with Mill, who really explained this quite well, I think he got this part pretty right. You, you know, I'm, again, I'm, I don't believe in determinism at all. But even if determinism were true, what Mill points out, it doesn't matter what I believe, what Mill points out is that when cue ball A hits, hits pool ball B and makes it fly away, the first cue ball didn't compel the second ball to move in that way, right? It would be as silly as saying the second ball willed to move that way. And so it pulled backwards in time to make the other one hit it just right so that it could go there. Neither one is making the other one do anything. It's when we say there's a law making it happen, what we mean is that it always applies that when something like this, hits something like this in this way that it does this thing. It's just descriptive. OK, there's no compulsion in it. And so that type of thing could apply to our minds and to our souls and to our consciousness and to our characters and to our wills. And none of that would mean that we're not free because it's not the sort of thing that has anything to do with, they say, with um, compulsion. OK, so why did we say that again? We said that again to remind us that. uh So, so he's saying all of these words, we're, we're confusing them, and the universal laws have nothing to do with compulsion. And then he says to the libertarians, he says, look, you better hope that determinism is true, because without it, moral talk means nothing. Right? I can't say punish guy A if I don't know why guy A did what he did, and I can't predict that his character will lead him to do it again. Right? If it's unpredictable, you've just lost your morality. You've lost your ethics. You've lost your sense of, of, of being able to speak meaningfully about praising or punishing people for what they do or their character. If their character isn't something that makes you more able to predict them and what they're going to do. Okay. The consciousness of responsibility. The feeling of responsibility means the realization that oneself, one's own psychic or one's own. Yeah, he says psychic one's own psyche or whatever, uh, possess it. So that, that one's own psyche possesses the motive, all right? That the motive is the point of the motive, the place where the motive has come together to make an action happen is located within the psyche of the individual who, who did the acting, unless someone had a gun to his head and made him do it, in which case it's in that guy's psyche, right? So... The realization that yourself, that you're the motive, that you're the thing that motivates the actions that you're doing must be applied in order to govern the acts of one's body. We feel guilty when we know we acted according to our own desires. This is the consciousness of freedom, right? I, I feel bad if I did a bad thing, not because I don't know why I did it and there's no way of understanding or predicting I could have. It's because I wish I had had a stronger character. I wish I hadn't succumbed to that. I wish I didn't do the thing that led to bad consequences or whatever, right? But that's me saying, you know, you could have predicted a moron like me would have made such a mistake, right? Otherwise, what am I regretting? That that things happen randomly or something like that? Okay. If we feel we could have done otherwise, then we feel guilt. This has nothing to do with indeterminism. So he's saying the indeterminists are motivated to be indeterminists because they're libertarians. They're motivated to be libertarians because they say the sense of freedom and my responsibility is a real thing I don't want to give up. And they falsely believe that they would have to give it up if they accept determinism. And what he's trying to highlight to them is, no, you do have moral responsibility. You are the motive of the, the motive point of the action is located within you. You're correctly described as the source of why that thing happened and you rightly feel guilt if you do something bad or pride if you do something good or whatever and that's because determinism is a universal principle or something like that it's not despite the fact or you no know, it doesn't require you to find indeterminism and break the causal chain in order to believe you have that you do have all of that you've made a mistake in thinking you would need to have no determinism you need determinism to really have it go ahead path yeah, uh, I just uh, isn't part of the whole determinism argument is that you're abdicating. Well, its implication is that you're 
I mean, you have no culpability for your actions. If everything, if everything's predetermined, there's no moral culpability. There is no moral judgment to be drawn from even. To yeah. Everything's pre, pre so, so then when you're saying what you're just saying, I'm not trying to be too reactionary, but it, it no. uh, just does not compute. And that's so, exactly, that's exactly. It could be that I misunderstood what you said, I'm not sure. No, no, no. What you're saying is exactly what the determinists think is true. And it's exactly what the metaphysical libertarians think is true. I mean, the, the argument that Schlick is making is turning it all on its head. He's saying, he's saying, I know, I know, I get it. You think you can't be free if it's all predetermined. But that predetermined is like the ball was determined to go that way once I hit the first ball. Well, okay. Sure, but then you're talking about physicality and, and the way objects move in relation to kinetic energy or something like that. It's not how humans react. Um, so it's apples and oranges, which I've always thought in a way. Since well, the he, beginning he of this class, I'm not saying I'm correct. No, 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 you're doing great. And But you got to remember, the point of philosophy is to argue. So no one has to apologize for arguing. Argue more. Most of these arguments are bullshit, to be honest. And people are just trying to justify not having. Well, I'm not saying it's true. Sure, but part sure, of me sure. says, uh, when I hear a lot of the arguments uh, of determinism versus libertarianism or free will, compatibilist, pragmatist, whatever, is people are trying to find some ground uh, to react against, like Paul Ray, who seemed to seemed to to me to be proposing a way of abdicating any responsibility for one's actions. And hey, you know, everything's predetermined anyway. Now, my first experience with any kind of determinism was as a, a child growing up in a religious home. Yeah. And and uh, and so the first time I heard about it, I will, we weren't Calvinists or I'm not even sure I'm using the terms correctly, but I was exposed to uh, religious aspects of predetermination. And I chewed it up, you know, way before the Internet. Just, you know, I was just in my room reading books and thinking about these things I was being told. And none of it made sense to me. Uh, I, just, I don't know. I, I'm, yeah. I'm probably talking too much and interrupting. No, no, this is the look. There's a reason. But I want to have a conversation. That's why I'm here. No, that's great. So there's a, there's a, there's a great book on philosophy. Another intro book on philosophy called "The Enduring Questions," and that's what we're doing right now. We're talking about the questions that won't go away, and the debate's not over. So when we present Moritz Schlick, we're not saying, "Hey, he ended the debate. He has all the right answers." Most people, so most camps in this debate agree with you completely, Path. The hard determinists completely agree with you. They say there can't be freedom if it's all predetermined. And the libertarians, the metaphysical ones, agree with you too. They say, yeah, I've got freedom, which means this thing ain't deterministic. I determine certain things by my agency. And so it's not all predetermined because I'm here and I haven't acted yet. And most people agree with you in this debate, except for this large middle ground of annoying compatibilists who one way or another are trying to tell us actually – you think you can't have your cake and eat it too. But in one way or another, I'm going to say this determinism thing doesn't preclude freedom because even if you could predict everything that was going to happen, you didn't make everything happen, right? We brought up the cue balls hitting each other because the determinists think that's exactly what, and you believe that that's exactly what your choices would be like if determinism were true. And these compatibilists, at least two of the three that we've looked at, are specifically saying, no, 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 <laughs> sorry, your, your physical law and your psychological law that says, oh, given this character in this situation with this incentive, X would be what he would choose or whatever. These psychological laws, even if they can predict it perfectly, they don't make it happen. They're just describing what a person like that would do in this situation. But a person is very much dependent on how much agency they have. I don't want to sound crude, right? But let's just say, uh, uh, listen, the way I think of it, this is going to sound horrible probably if anybody's recording this, but, uh, you know, a deformed child or uh, a child with a horrible birth defect like Down syndrome or just something you would never wish upon your child, right, is much more subject to, these aspects of determinism and, 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 and destination of their life because they have less agency. Whereas, you know, a 165 IQ rocket surgeon, you know, who can speak five languages has much more free will. So 
Maybe. Well, I agree with you. Freedom is something that's on a scale. I, and you have well, to- well, I'm not saying I make the best argument for it, but but these are the things I think about. And uh, I thought I'd bring it up. You know? No, well, you're I, right. I definitely that's think agency, more- has agency in one's life and the ability to make decisions rationally or with experience or high intelligence or, you know, whatever, uh, definitely has to do with one's agency. And then this uh, conversation becomes far more dynamic between uh, determinism and uh, free will or, or, or uh, manic libertarianism or whatever it's called. I forget the term sometimes. Sorry. Oh, shit. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. So. Um, so it, it's a, it's annoying that all of us in this class actually have the same instinct that there's <laughs> you know, we're not really buying this compatibilist view <laughs> and we're all also not inclined towards hard determinism. We all happen to be inclined in this direction where I think I agree with you. And I think all of us in this class have expressed an inclination to think that you're correct when you say, one, that freedom is sort of on a scale and you have to struggle and claw your way up to get some more freedom. Um, and that uh, so, you know, lots of determinism might account for many decisions, but not all. Uh, and also that there's something incompatible about these two ideas and that you can't really have your cake and eat it too. I think um, I think most of us agree, or are, I should say this way, most of us are inclined to agree, which means we have to give a really fair hearing to all the opposite arguments because, uh, or we need to get someone in this class that is a real hard compatibilist so that we can we can really make sure that we're giving a fair hearing to, the, to this other argument. Um, You know, this is a philosophical principle. You weigh argument and evidence and reason against your own inclination. So if I'm inclined to agree with you, I should need a stronger argument to make me agree with you because I have to balance out the scale of the fact that eh, I'm likely to agree with you even if I don't have enough good reason because that's what I'm inclined to think. Um, So that's a good thinking principle that we get to talk about here, which is, all right, let's you know, we're, we're not reading Schlick because we think he's right, but we're reading him because he's making a heck of a case and we just want to make sure we've understood it correctly. And, and but with all that being said, we're going to have long discussions on this today and, and in the after show. And I, I think I think you're I think you're right, probably, that there's something incompatible about these two. But damn, this is a pretty impressive argument as well. Like if if so, if you say, OK, if it's because you brought up predetermination, right? The predestination. And this is, of course, like Mill pointed out, an argument that the religious philosophers have been having for like thousands of years, for a whole thousand years in the Middle Ages, where they said, wait, if God knows everything, then how can we be said to choose anything? Because he made us and he knew what we we're going to choose. And so he chose it when he made us. It's it's exactly the same argument that the Calvinists and the Arminian, Ar- Arminians have in, in, uh, in you know, Southern Baptist churches every day in the United States, it, especially if they're about the age of 15 and they're smart. <laughs> That's when you get into this sort of thing. But um, Mill is in a similar camp to Schlick, and they both seem to be saying something like this. And Mill said it very well, which was, okay, um, these universal laws, these principles that would allow, if you knew everything about all the factors, you could make all the predictions and know where everything was going to go. Even if that was true, maybe it's not true, but even if it were true, knowing what's going to happen ahead of time doesn't mean that the person who knows it made it happen. Having a principle doesn't mean that the formula makes it happen. Where's the compulsion here? It's still you doing what you do. We just knew everything about you and everything about the situation you were in. And so we predicted what you were going to do. Now, I'm not sure if we buy that or not, but that's the argument that Schlick is going to try to throw away. And we're actually going to read an article, I think in two classes, probably Friday, called Is um, is the Determinism Free Will Argument a Pseudo Problem? And he's the, the person writing that is directly attacking Schlick. So everything we're reading today is going to be directly attacked by another philosopher who says, no, this really is a problem. And you can't just say it's a word game that made us think it was a problem. So, you know, there's lots of philosophers that agree with you, and I think most of us are inclined to. That argument melted my mind a bit when I was young. Yeah, predestination and all that. Yeah, we will talk about that a lot in the after show. That's a really good argument. 
and it's a fun topic. So it's what you get into when you're clever and you're about 16 to 18 and you grow up in, in a church that cares about theology to some degree. Okay, so, um, so m m probably the majority in one way or another of people in this argument, certainly the majority of camps completely agree with you, Pat. They say, there's a problem here. You can't tell me it's deterministic. You can't tell me you can predict everything I'm gonna do. And then I still have a reason to think I'm free. You can't do that because I am free. And so you couldn't possibly ever do that. And if you could, then I would have to admit I'm not free. Something like that. That's the incompatibilist position. Uh, but Schlick is here trying to tell us, no, you think that. And I know why you think it. It's because we're using language that just sort of gets all muddled in two different regions, right? N the law is necessary. That just means the planets always follow the gravitational principle. It doesn't mean they want to not and they're being forced to. That's a different kind of necessary. You need to obey the law isn't the same thing as if you fall, if you jump off a cliff, you necessarily will fall down, right? It's not like we're making you. It's more like you chose to, and now you're doing what you chose to do. And I could have predicted it, right? I could have predicted that you would have fallen down if you jumped off a cliff, but my predicting it didn't make you do it. The law of gravity didn't make you do it. The law of gravity isn't a law making you fall. That's what they're saying. They're saying the law of gravity is a descriptor of the fact that if you choose to jump, that's what's going to happen to you. And I can predict it. I predict that if you jump, you will fall. I predict it because of my understanding of a law that necessarily applies. But when I say that, I'm not saying I'm going to make you fall or the law will make you fall. No, you chose to jump and there you go. I predicted it, but that doesn't mean I made it happen. And neither did gravity. Gravity didn't make it happen. The law of gravity, they're saying, is nothing but a descriptor of what will happen given certain circumstances. So you can be free at the exact same time as determinism is true. And some people make that argument and say, but I don't know if determinism is true, but I know it's no threat to freedom. And many say, well, I hold to determinism. Mill says, I am a determinist. Everybody knows the principles apply universally. And so we're all determinists, whether we admit it or not. But luckily, we're still free. And it has nothing to do with our freedom. And it's just a descriptive thing. And you shouldn't want to be rid of it. And Schlick keeps saying, you shouldn't want to be rid of something like that because then you lose all your moral responsibility. Because if nobody can predict how you're going to act, why, why would you be punished for doing a bad thing unless people predict you're the kind of person who's therefore likely to do it again? What, punishment wouldn't make any sense because I can't predict what you're going to do because you're just that free agent who knows what you're going to do. So you lose moral responsibility, says Schlick, if you give up on something as basic as it people do what it makes sense and you can probably predict it to some degree. And if you knew everything, you could predict it perfectly. Again, we don't agree with that. I mean, we don't have to agree with that. I will tell you, I don't agree with it, right? There's th I, there's a lot in it that seems pretty true to me, but there's, you know, it's missing something and I, and I have my quarrels with it. Uh, so I'm not saying it to say we should accept it. I'm saying, let's just understand exactly what it is he's saying. And it's a heck of an argument. I mean, if you haven't ever heard it before, it might make you say, hold on a second. I was really worried about this determinism thing. I thought, oh no, it's probably true. My gut tells me it's true, but then I'm not free. How do I move forward in life? Like this is a real crisis for a lot of people when they first think about it and, and they resolve it in one way or another. But when you first hear Slick say, wait a minute, or Mill say, wait a minute, <laughs> there's no problem here. <laughs> Obviously you're free. You made a choice. You're responsible. That's why we'll punish you if you do something wrong. Why? Because determinism is true. You need determinism to be true to be free. And that's so, it's so interesting an argument. And there's, and there's actually probably today more people in the compatibilist camp, and it doesn't matter who's populating things most. Uh, compatibilism is more popular than probably any other position lately, just because of fads. And when I say that, you know, I'm not endorsing it because I'm against fads and I don't want to be moving in the same direction as a fad. I don't think that's a point for your thinking. However, I'll also say that the trend is moving away from compatibilism. So it's sort of like the largest church right now is, is in some sort of a, of a million Schlickian, Humean place of compatibilism, but also the move towards libertarianism, actually, and uh, really polarization because there's more hard determinists than ever before, but they're not that 
popular. And there's actually quite a movement towards a kind of metaphysical libertarianism. So it's the largest church, but it's also splitting that just, just to talk about the fads. So everything you say path, uh, is agreed with by many, many philosophers. In fact, some that we're going to be reading. Um, so you have a point for sure. Uh, let, all right, let's see here. Let's see if we can move through this here. Um, <clears throat> causality as the presupposition of responsibility. Okay, he's going to really underline this. So let's see his, his argument. He says, we require, we need it to be the case that the causes of a man's behavior be reasonably determinable, that we could determine what they are and, and what they would mean in order to justify saying that he is morally responsible. This might be his strongest argument. Schlick's strongest argument might be this. If the reason why you are inclined to be an indeterminist is that you want moral responsibility not to be shattered, not to be ruined, you want to hold on to the idea that, wait, right is right and wrong is wrong and it's right to punish the wrongdoer and all of that. The only way that makes sense, says Schlick, is if the bad person's bad behavior predictably indicates to you future bad behavior. Otherwise, punishing him would just be a random hissy fit that you're throwing over something he happened to do, and you have no reason to think he would do something similar in the future, right? That's a that's a heck of a curveball to throw at us, right? If we're thinking, I want to be a an indeterminist, or I want to, you know, moral responsibility must be defended against these evil deniers of free will and all of this other stuff. For somebody to throw a, 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 a baseball at our, at our testicles like this and say, no, you're fighting against the very thing you need in order to hold on to the things you want to hold on to. But isn't that a simplistic, isn't that a simplistic argument in a way? Because uh, they're presenting, it's, it's always this thing about the prisoner and the punitive uh, you know, justification for imprisoning someone when they're totally abdicating responsibility for protecting society. So I just feel like, although they're trying, uh, I see what they're saying, and, and it's, you know, it's comfortable within the framework of this argument. It's still a little bit almost disingenuous because that's well, not the only reason you punish someone. And uh, I just wanted to mention that. I know I've mentioned it before, but it always just, gets me going a bit, you know? Wait, I've got a question for you there, because that's interesting. So so let me ask you a question about that, because that's quite interesting. So the first thing you said, I think I want to I want to make one quick comment, which is everything you just said is true of the hard determinists. I'm, not all of them, but Paul Ray. It's clearly true of Paul Ray. Paul Ray is arguing for determinism because he wants to say moral responsibility is an illusion. There's no such thing. It's clearly he's motivated to say that. And not for evil reasons necessarily. He's motivated maybe because he doesn't want to. He Maybe he's taking on the sins of the world and saying all the bad things bad people do is because we haven't built the society well enough to not determine that bad things will happen, right? So, but he's taking away their moral responsibility. But in any case, he's clearly motivated in the way you're saying. But I don't think that's true of the compatibilists. Right. I, like so the compatibilists are not determinists. They're not hard determinists. Right. The hard determinists are trying to get rid of freedom. Compatibilists like Schlick are in a totally different camp. They want they want freedom. They want moral responsibility and they believe they have it. They're arguing for that to maintain it and to keep it. And I don't think it's disingenuous. I think the hard determinists might think they're disingenuous. Oh, you don't really believe in determinism like I do. You want to keep freedom. And I know freedom's bullshit. And the libertarians might look at them and say, oh, you don't really keep freedom. You don't really keep moral responsibility. You're too much of a determinist, right? That's what they would look like to either of these other two camps. But the camp they're in is at least trying to have it both ways. They want the determinism. But I think they're also, I don't think they're motivated to get rid of moral responsibility. I think I they spoke. really, really I, want I to. I spoke. I think the whole determinism argument is a bit dis disingenuous. And I understand that. Uh, Maurice Schlitz or whatever, he, he didn't, uh, you know, he, he's not arguing for determinism. He's arguing against it. And I probably stand closer to him than I would have determined it. But he's what, what arguing, else, I bespoke. What I'm saying is this whole determinism, this whole determinism argument. Yeah. It's kind of ludicrous in a way. Yeah. Well, okay. So Paul Ray, uh, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you. But I really want to get to my question because I'm really interested about something about what you said. So really quickly, you're, you're right. 
Paul Ray is a hard determinist and he doesn't believe in moral responsibility. It's worse than you think it is because he's not disingenuous. He says it in the title of his article. Moral responsibility is an illusion. He's not pretending. He's not being disingenuous. He's no hypocrite. He's the guy that says, no, this moral responsibility thing is bullshit because, look, determinism is true. And the other thing we might word slightly differently, although what you said is correct, is that Schlick is a determinist and he is a free willer. He's a compatibilist. He gets to have them both. Well, I think that's valid in, in some ways. But some, sometimes the argument that they present isn't, I don't know, you know, I, I can point to things in it. But, 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 but you're talking at that time, and, and then I blurt in later like I do. You know. But uh, um, I can't remember them all. But uh, I'm arguing against the term. Well, I just know the determinism is bullshit. Frankly, <laughs> you know, you know, I, well, there are aspects of it, but I think I honestly, and I'm not, you know, I mean, uh, there can be like the most rich guy who's got a bad set of parents who, who like all of a sudden gets thrown out of his family or whatever, and then his options in life are predetermined or whatever that they are determined to not be as good as they would have been beforehand, and who knows, who knows, who knows. But 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 this guy's arguing well, and uh, uh, my, my main reactions are against determinism. I, I just think it's all just a crock, uh, app since the beginning, and I'm not very good at explaining it. I no, guess. you're doing you're doing absolutely fine. I'm going to write down the question I want to ask you so that we make sure we talk about it before the end. I guess you better fire it at me real quick before I start talking to you. Well, tw Twilight was trying to interject a second ago. Yep. <coughs> yeah. Um. I just thought it just came to mind when you were talking about um, that Schlick had a good um, argument for determinism on the basis that we um, have a good idea that uh, there will be a repeat offender. And so we build, you know, you know, our, our justice around that or whatever. But I would actually think that my, my response to that would be, I actually don't think that is as effective an argument and you can, you know, tell me if this is valid or not, but it, um, I mean, it doesn't really go against indeterminism since, you know, indeterminists don't say to what degree indeterminism is valid. Right. So, um, so it could be the case that, you know, um, you know, repeat offenders are predictive on the you know like a, a volitionist or free will whatever you want or an indeterminist would could argue that sure we know that repeat offenders are a thing and that you know we, we try to stop that but that's because how do you know you they're know, a thing well yeah because it's it's uh it, it uh determinism is responsible it, determinism is responsible for a large share of their behavior but Good. Not all of it. Yeah, yeah, so. that's completely reasonable. I think Lewis said something similar, right? It's like it's not everything a person does is free. There's just very limited definitions of a place where you can overcome your inclinations. That's right to say that that's a free or an immoral choice or whatever. And yeah, so I think I think you're right to point out also that um, the conversation between the extremes gets pretty cloudy when nobody seems to want to grant. That there are degrees of freedom, that there that it's on a it's on a spectrum, as the leftists like to say everything is right. It's more free or less free, not absolutely free or totally enslaved. It's it's like maybe there's such a thing as totally enslaved when someone's pointing a gun at your head, but even then, or maybe when you've got a mental illness or something, right? There's all sorts of people who we say, well, it's not right to punish them. They're not the source of why this happened. They had a brain injury and they did something. We need to get rid of their brain injury problem. We need to fix that because that's the cause of the action instead of, you know, whipping them when they're, they're already a miserable person who's done things they wouldn't otherwise choose to do. So maybe there's like a, a pull, a pull. 
you know, there's a polar bonding and covalent bonding in chemistry, right? And when you're in high school, they say there's two kinds of ways that two atoms can bond with each other, polar bonding or covalent bonding. Polar bonding, something steals an electron, the charge makes them bond. The other one, they're sharing an electron. But then when you when you get into new chapters, you realize, no, it's on a spectrum. There's something like total absolute polar bonding, but then there's degrees to which or total, you know, total covalent bonding, but then everything else is a degree to which you're more polar or less polar. And I think that, I think that most people probably recognize that, but it's hard to keep it clear in the debate and a lot of the arguments that people make. I think you're right to point out that they, they seem to lose sight of that. Um, let me remove this. It might make things go faster. Or, uh, we're gonna we're having a new studio built. We're gonna be plugged right into the internet. But for now, I got to be careful how many things are on my screen because sometimes it, it slows everything down. Um, I think you're right about that. So, but you said something. Here's a question from Schlick. Oh no, you answered it already. You said, well, what Schlick says makes sense because there's a degree to which things are determined, and some people can achieve levels of freedom where agency and freedom really are things in the world. Uh, so so that's your answer, Schleck. I, let me put it to path, though. Um, I think this is what Schlick would say to all of us while we're talking. So anybody who wants to answer, this is directed to everybody. <clears throat> if you do something really great, like run into a burning building to rescue a child or a kitten, just anything, you, you put your, you go against your own inclinations to do something heroic because it's the right thing to do and because you know it's the right thing to do and you're motivated to do it in, in the sense that you want to do the right thing, but your natural inclinations are saying stay safe and be a coward and hide. Okay. If you do that, and that's clearly a, that's clearly a place where you have a lot of freedom, right? If there's a scale of freedom you're exercising agency when you go against all the other things that would push you in the other direction to just do what's right. When you do that, why should you feel pleased at the memory that you did the right thing? Why should you expect people not to whip you for doing that? Why would you expect people to say thank you and, and praise you maybe even? Not that you did it for those praises, but why would you expect people to be like, oh my God, you rescued, thank you so much, right? If you're indeterministic, if, if it's true that in that moment of your actual freedom, you're indeterministic, nobody has a reason to believe you would ever act like that again in the future. Why would they encourage you to do it in the future unless you did it because of principles that make sense and make you predictable. Are you asking me this question? Yeah. Yeah. If you want to answer it. I, uh, I'm not sure I understood at the end. I thought I understood the question. And then so yeah, so what, Schlick is, what Schlick is trying to say is that the reason we blame people and the reason we praise them is that we're trying to encourage some behaviors and discourage others. Right. And in ourselves and in the people around us. So we, we feel shame. We feel guilt. We feel pride. We point the finger and we applaud people because we look at the action. We say, "Ooh, more of that, please. Or, "Ooh, less of that, please. And so all of these things we're doing are basically ways of voting. Yes, more of that. No, less of that. But in the moment where you do a very truly free thing, like like uh, Lewis's idea of absolute choice, because you're going against all your inclinations, where you're the most free possible, if that's being free, because you're not being pushed by things that normally would push you. If that's where you're more free, that should be the place where it's least reasonable to praise or blame you. Because who knows why you did it? I don't know if you'll ever do it again. The what I'm noticing is that the 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 analogy you're using, the metaphor you, you know, so uh, is really, really crisis oriented. Right? Sure. So, so, but generally people don't act upon crisis oriented criteria uh, walking through life. Uh, you know, life and death burning fire situations. I tell you what, we all get a, an adrenaline rush. And if you have the ability and let's say for lack of a better term, a moral compass, then you're going to go in there and that's your free will. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Your moral compass? You mean your character? 
your character makes you because you're a good person you do the right thing even though it's scary i, I feel like it's a semantics in a way uh, please you, rephrase your question no I, I i'm not i'm not arguing with you i'm saying is that what you're telling me is that the person's good character made them do a good thing well the thing is i mean different cultures have different definitions of that good character as well so i think we need to caveat that so uh, okay but okay but yes, is, yes, is there such a thing as sure. a heroic act but, but, but what i'm saying is uh, some of our personal free will choices at times are uh, based off based upon the group. And uh, um, but as far as the question you're answering, yeah, absolutely, that's a totally free will situation. Whoa! In, in my opinion, the, the more uh, whoa, 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 the whoa, whoa. you get defined in crisis moments. Yes, I do believe that. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to pre pretend to be Moritz Schlick right now. So while I'm responding to you, like, whoa, 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 I'm pretending to be Schlick. So here's his response to you. Whoa, whoa, what do you mean a great man did a great thing? He did the right thing. He acted against all the incl He was free. He freely chose to do a good thing. Are you impressed by that? Do you want to applaud that? Do you think it would be good to be like that? Yeah. Why? Well, I guess it depends on your uh, your values. I, I Does a suppose. good person do good things in the future? Would it be good to be that type of person? Yes, but that's not what most people choose their decisions upon. No, of course not. But this is the point. This is Schlick's whole point. You're being a determinist right now. That's his point. You're saying his character, predict. I can predict that the great man will do great things, that the good man will do good things. I applaud him because I know his character. The determinist says if you well, know fucking him, beautiful, then I fucking think this guy's the best one yet. <laughs> well, don't <How> about that. <laughs> I misunderstood him. Now, yeah. now that you're explaining him to me, I'm like, yeah, this okay, guy's okay. my man. That's my well, man right there. That's fine. You can agree with him. That's fine. I, so, so I don't I, know. I'm just having fun with it. No, that's fine. I hate when people switch. I, I hate when people agree with me. I'm fine if you want to agree with Schlick. So, <clears throat> so, so. So that's now we've understood Schlick. Schlick's whole point is when you're most free and doing the most admirable, important, moral thing, you better hope that determinism is true. Because otherwise, I know nothing about your character. I didn't learn anything about your character. If I knew something about your character, I might predict you would do similar things in the future. That's determinism. He's saying that's determinism. I embrace determinism because I do believe in moral freedom. I do believe in character. I do believe in choice. And I need determinism for any of those things to make any sense at all. How's that for turning the whole argument inside out from what we normally think of it as? That's pretty good. I didn't catch that. I read it and I listened to the video, but I didn't catch that part of it somehow. Uh, all right. So I'm not saying we agree with him, but uh, you might and you might not. But how about that for a heck of a curveball, huh? That's pretty good. Shavad, Shavad, Twilight, anybody? <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> getting something out of my mouth right now. I actually have a uh, a retort to that. Um, so, I would reject his uh, his argument there that <clears throat> this this the idea of randomness. He's equating indeterminism with randomness. Mm -hmm. I would actually kind of echo past sen sentiment that. That's disingenuous. I think that is, um, I don't know if, if straw man is the right word, but. Oh, you don't think indeterminism is chaos and random. Right. Yeah. I, I don't think it necessarily has to be. So if, and this is actually where I found that I, I think that Schlick aired is that overall, I, um, I kind of liked him. I thought he was effective but not convincing so i think he was effective at what he was trying to do um but he didn't convince me of sort of the larger thing that he purposely didn't touch on or whatever but he it, it, where he in my opinion I, I was like i was reading it, i was like he's doing good he's doing good then at the end um i felt like he he overextended himself and he unnecessarily sort of went into waters that he shouldn't have by um uh, trying to attack indeterminism 
kind of like he didn't really need to do that because I, his wonder, whole... I wonder what you mean by indeterminism doesn't mean randomness. I think a lot of people in this debate, maybe they're making the same kind of mistake that Schlick is saying people make about determinism. But what can you describe to me a kind of indeterminism that doesn't sound like chaos and randomness to me? Sure. So <clears throat> this is not like my committed belief or anything, but it's one sort of like it's it's one uh, possibility, basically. So and I think it's an intuitive possibility. Like if we just think about how a lot of people see life in the afterlife. So could it not be possible that we are, you know, both in the world and we have souls and there's this sort of like, um, uh, I don't know what you would say, like this X, this other dimension that overlaps this one and it interacts with this one. And so um, it's, it's conceivable that it interacts with this world in ways that aren't random. And I think that, okay. Um, to, to, to uh, like his assumption that like, like the very first assumption of indeterminism to be random it, to me is disingenuous because we just don't okay. intuitively think that way. All right. Let me, let me ask you a question about this though. So I think you could be right that the world is like that. I have no disagreement with that right now. What I'm asking is, these spiritual forces that cause things to happen to some degree in this world, isn't that deterministic? We just don't have access to the data of what's causing it. So it's not random, but it's also still deterministic, it seems. It's just we don't have access to a lot of the factors that go into being, perhaps. Right. The picture you're saying is here's the world, the deterministic physical world, whatever. But there's this spiritual world next to it or overlaying on top of it or whatever that interjects and does things. And the world we live in has the effect of those things. So you're saying they're not random. But when you say they're not random, don't you mean they're caused? They're just caused by something you don't have access to the knowledge of. Or full. I would I would at least say it's conceivable that that's not the case, for instance, like just thinking about, um, I mean, could we not be um, parts of God? Could we not interact with God? Like is, you know, prayer, like for instance, prayer, you know, the effects of prayer, it, it, it's, um, um, I'm trying to, it's sure. getting, I'm trying to maybe, if you can rephrase, like re ask me yeah, that again. Fine. Like, you're doing fine. You find your words. Take your time. Find your words. So let, let me ask. Let's say I pray to God. Uh, oh, Lord, help deliver me from my bad habits and help me find the right path. Something like that. Right. So I, I say I'm, I want to strive to um, become a better person. And I look to the heavens for inspiration and guidance in doing that. So I'm praying. Okay. So I pray to the divine, I pray to the spiritual realm, I pray to God, whatever. Uh, my interactions with God, if he does hear my prayer and reach down and, and help or some, isn't that all rational? Like, it, how is that outside of causality? And I, mean, I don't mean God is forced to help or I'm forced to pray. I mean, without thinking of it as compulsion, would it make sense to say, I say a prayer in the hopes that something that doesn't make any rational sense will happen? If what you mean by it doesn't make rational sense is, well, God did something, fine. But if what you mean is it doesn't make sense that God did something, God saying God did it is making sense out of it, right? It's still in the deterministic language of, well, God did something. I have evidence that God did something because I got out of my bad, horrible place when I prayed to God. So God, that's my evidence that God is real and he did something, right? Doesn't it still have to be causal? I don't think you get out of Schlick's idea of determinism from that is what I'm saying. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I have to think about that one. Because Schlick has a very, a very, let's say, neutered idea of determinism, right? It's not compulsion. It's just like Mill. It's not... God was forced to, he followed the law because he had to, or any of that. It's just things are happening reasonably, 
right? If I don't repent and pray, then nothing good happens. If I do, and if God is real, maybe that's the explanation for why things got better. I'm not saying any of this is true or how the world works necessarily. I'm saying if that's the conceptualization of how we're describing it, I'm not sure the spiritual realm requires an overthrow of Schlick's idea of determinism, since his idea is just, if you knew everything, it would all make sense. Something like that. Once again, I mean, I'm, I'm interjecting, but uh, once again, that's an abdication of responsibility and culpability. And, you know, it's a different, it's a different way of doing it, but prayer is... It could be, but it doesn't have well, to be. Well, kind of is. I, I think somebody could say... Um, I'm responsible. I've seen it always, but I'm saying I've seen that before. Let's put it that way. Yeah, uh, sure. It could. Before. I agree with you completely. Somebody could use divine terminology to excuse away everything they're doing. Absolutely. But I don't think that the ideas necessitate that, right? Somebody could say, I have, I have made a mess of everything and I need guidance to get out of it, right? If, if I say I went to a counselor to get help, that's not me abdicating responsibility necessarily. It could be me saying, hey, I want you to help me take responsibility and, and move in the right direction. So Same here's way. a wrinkle. I got a wrinkle if you want to yeah. hear a wrinkle. So Please. the thing about destination or determination is that you can pretty much use determinism to predict that if a guy's in a foxhole and his shells are coming in, he might start praying in a way. You could. There are some atheists in Fox. But then, but then again, that's his choice, but, which is kind of why this whole argument is it's so unprovable. Well, I think that William William James's idea that you can't settle it with a scientific kind of argument is correct. I, I think I agree with that. Savad, uh, we haven't heard from you yet. I'm going to give you a moment if you want to interject. Otherwise, um, let's see if we can wrap up this this one section we started here. Anybody else? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I did. I, I did have something a little bit ago. I'm trying to. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think what it was. That's OK. Take can you, yeah. Can you. Can you pose the, the question again? I know there's been numerous questions, but yeah, there's been a couple of questions. The one that Twilight brought up about the spiritual realm interjecting into this world, and maybe that makes things not deterministic or. <sighs> the question. Yeah, I mean, I mean, having saying you made it, uh, you did a good thing because of your character and then I can. Yeah. I can determine what you're going to do in the future based on your character. Partially. I mean, I mean, maybe. Yeah. But but is it, what's that? So, so the deterministic position is if I knew everything, I could predict perfectly, but I don't know everything. So I don't really know. Right. Like, Maybe the guy who committed the crime immediately repented and had a change of heart and would never do it again. Well, I don't really know, but we're going to punish him anyway. You know what I mean? Like, you don't, he's not saying you have to have total knowledge of everyone's character. He's saying if you want a sense of moral pride and shame, if you want a sense of punishment and reward that makes sense, you have to think to some degree you can understand a person's character and that their character determines it's a part of what determines what they're going to choose to do and that's all the determinists ever should have claimed because that's what they actually that's what determinism actually means and that's all they ever said was if i knew everything about a person and their past and their character and their makeup and all the factors going into them which i don't know all of that but if i did know all of it in principle i could predict sorry hold on let me fix this i could predict what they're going to do that's the determinist print that's the determinist conviction and what Schlick is saying is, you better hope that's true, or else you've got no sense of morality, shame, guilt, blame, punishment, pride, praise, reward. None of those things make any sense unless, to whatever degree you can know about a person's character, helps in you predicting how they're going to act in the future. You, he's not claiming that you have total knowledge and you can perfectly predict, because even the determinists aren't claiming that. They say, if I had total knowledge, I could perfectly predict, which means... 
my personal knowledge aids me in predicting. And Moritz is pointing out, hey, nobody's noticed before, but the whole partial knowledge aiding in predicting, that's all necessary for this whole morality talk that you guys on the libertarian side want to rescue. And I want to rescue. Schlick says, I want to rescue that. Let me show you how to rescue it. It's by embracing a loose form of determinism rather than rejecting it, thinking it, it challenges it. Instead, it's necessary for it. You need it. So that's his argument. Let's finish it and see if uh, see see what it provokes. See what questions. We're almost done, so I'm going to read the last bit and then uh, ask whatever you want to ask about this because we're almost done with Schlick. <clears throat> we require that the causes of a man's behavior be reasonably determinable in order to justify saying that he is morally responsible. Hold on, sorry. I messed this up. Sorry, I just got kicked. So I was going to say, so what if it's viewed as a good thing from the outside? So you say, all right, this guy goes in and he rescues this person from a burning building. Uh, right. Maybe, maybe, maybe they did that not to save. Well, they did it to save the person. But maybe it was to make an impression and impress somebody. So it wasn't selfless. It was actually selfish. Sure. They you keep going. Does that change change anything? You are gonna love our ethics class. When we when we get to the moral <laughs> this is this is the this is the core of one of the biggest debates in ethics. And uh, from the beginning of ethics, with so well, from Socrates and before, it's this question of, do you really need a totally selfless act to know if anything moral has happened? So, <clears throat> so we're going to get to talk about that way more in depth in the future. And like, like Edwards and Paps pointed out in the beginning, all philosophical questions intertwine with all the other ones. And you can follow a path, any of an infinite number of paths from all. What's important to Schlick's argument is that I don't think he's doing what Lewis was doing, where he's talking about an absolute free choice, right? Lewis was starting, was trying to set up a, you don't have any reason to do this, except that you feel it's the right thing to do. And he says, in that moment, you have a moral choice and your choice is real and your freedom is real. And so in that limited way, that's real, right? That's Lewis. Schlick is trying to say, in your, well, I kind of would like to do the right thing because I generally feel like people like having sex with people with high moral character. And I also kind of uh, don't want to be ashamed of myself later when people point at me and say, he was there, he could have rescued the child, right? Like, who knows what all your motivations are, but to whatever they are, they don't have to be absolutely altruistic for Schlick's point. Schlick's point is, okay, whatever. To whatever degree you're doing any action, but notice it's even highlightable in the most extreme version where you're doing exactly the opposite of any impulse that you have. But it's also true all the way down, right? If you're mostly just trying to look good, trying to not feel guilty because there's a pain and pleasure motivation or a social pressure to conform or, you know, I can't live with myself after not doing this, but it's really I can't live with other people or no, it doesn't matter what. That's, let's say there's a person who represents every single step along that spectrum of complete moral you uh, duty-based uh, altruism right down to uh, I'm trying to pretend to look good because I'm hoping to get people to do things for me, like sort of a Saul Goodman from uh, the, that character. He was always pretending to do good things. He often did in order to get right. it. Breaking, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, yeah. yeah. From Breaking Bad, right? So it doesn't matter. For all of those people, for all of them, to whatever degree you learn something about their character from whatever their situation is and what they show you about their character, doesn't matter. You learn what about Saul's character by the things he's doing. You learn about the great altruist and the noble hero by the things he's doing. If you're learning something about their character and that matters to you, it's because you believe that character predicts how they'll behave in the future. You are a determinist 
according to Schlick, and you need to be in order to believe in morality and talk of, of the whole thing, the whole spectrum. That's an interesting choice of a character because, in my opinion, Saul Goodman is... Uh, I mean, obviously, he's just a Hollywood fabrication, but, but his character is very free will, in my opinion. I feel like he has a lot of high amounts of agency, fluid personality, able to adapt to all kinds of situations. And uh, none of these things really get taken into account in these arguments so far, it seems to me. And I keep well, you know, ranting with it. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying that's interesting what you said there. So, so uh, it's funny we get to talk about a, a character like this. It's always worth talking about fictional characters. They're more interesting than real ones usually. So uh, Saul Bellow, or Saul Bellow, geez. Saul Goodman from this show is um, very much a Joker-like character, right? He's a bit chaotic, a little of an indeterminist, right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's free will. Maybe it is. Maybe maybe it's the real kind of free will that the the anti-determinist indeterminists are really looking for. And maybe you're right. Maybe he really highlights that. He's definitely that wild card character. And so maybe yeah, you're. I think you make a really cool point there, Path. That bringing up Saul Goodman is a bad okay, idea. Okay, for instance, as an addendum, let me add this. Uh, if you've seen uh, Better Call Saul, there's that character, you know. Uh, who's that black pickpocket dude oh right? the bodyguard yeah what's his name the bodyguard yeah he's a bodyguard at the shop but yule. he also used yule. The, uh yule yes thank you uh so yule i mean he has observably less uh capacity in agency he doesn't have the financial uh family uh, his brother isn't you know a k sam lawyer or whatever so very different uh, aspects of possibilities in the free will in these cases, in my opinion. You guys have brought up an interesting idea. It's very Aristotelian in a sense. So uh, when we talk about duty, we're talking about Kant and deontology, and we talk about utilitarianism and doing things selfless, whatever. But the, the virtue ethicists like Aristotle often have the same inclination that you guys have voiced a couple of times now, which is that maybe wealth is required for being virtuous. But I hope that we're not confusing something, and maybe we're not. Maybe there's, maybe we are. So having agency, you know, I mean, Yule has a character. You know, you can tell his character. His character is to, you know, understand the job that needs to be done and be a really good henchman in a sense, right? Well, you could say he's freely choosing to do that all the time, or you could say, well, he has no money and he can't do anything else. And so Saul pays him and he does what he tells him. And then you might have different ideas of how free he is. Um, I don't know. I think I, I think that uh, you don't necessarily have to have a lot of money and power in order to have freedom. You you clearly have more options, right? And, and Well, I wasn't really referring to the money and uh, power aspect, although that's uh, a part of it. I'm speaking more to intelligence and credentials, uh, genetics, and um, well, he's being close. able to navigate in, in, in social networks more freely, right? Which uh, are all nuanced, uh, nuanced aspects, I would say. Yeah, but nobody's speaking bad. about that, and I think these are valid points. Yeah, no, that's a, certainly a valid thing to talk about. I, I, I don't know why I'd want to quarrel with you about the character, but I just feel like Yule is a guy that you can – you can tell him what needs to be done and he gets it done, which is not something that a dumb person does. You know, like Saul can rely on him. You know, it's like he's he can do the pickpocket thing. He can fool these genius lawyers and judges and stuff by setting them up in a situation because he's sort of subtly paying attention to understanding Saul's trick and playing the role to make it happen. So I don't really think of him as sort of like a, a blown around by the wind sort of, uh, you know, agentless sort of person um but that that could just be a quarrel about his character maybe i've interpreted it differently or wrong compared to the way you're interpreting it but the other thing you said is completely legitimate also which is that you know maybe there's something to having power that aids in whether or not you really have any agency or freedom and maybe it's like a hierarchy of values. First, you can't be starving, right? You can't be a free person if you're starving because all you need to do is get food 
and you don't really have a lot of choices. You, you're going to do whatever you got to do to get food, right? But maybe if you've got plenty of silos full of grain, now you can start to think to about, well, what would I like to do with my life? Like, I don't know why we've brought this up, but it, it's come up a few times in a few comments. And I echo the fact that it's a completely legitimate thing to consider. And it's something that, that you know, certain virtue ethicists like Aristotle have said that you can't really be a virtuous person unless you're wealthy, according to Aristotle. It's not just that you have to um, not be starving. It's that some of the virtues require a great amount of money. You can't be magnanimous for instance, you can't be magnificent. Magnificence is one of the virtues, according to Aristotle. Uh, how can you be magnificent if you can't spend too much money on something that doesn't matter? That's magnificence. So your daughter gets married and you buy a $100,000 chandelier to use one day at the wedding. Well, that's pretty great. It's a part of what Aristotle would call a greatness or a goodness of, of the virtue of magnificence, but it's not available to you unless you've got $100,000 to blow. So uh, this is totally off topic, but when we get into ethics, we'll be discussing stuff like that. And probably in the, in the section on moral judgments, we'll have a chance to discuss it more. It's not exactly on topic for this debate, although that, I mean, I'm not complaining. That doesn't bother me at all. But the stuff you're saying is instinctively exactly what the conversation ends up talking about sometimes, those, especially those other topics. So I guess I just wanted to underline that because um, I'm surprised by it. I didn't expect that to come up. It's curious and interesting. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's do this. I'm going to finish really quickly with the notes on Schlick, and then we'll have a general discussion. Then in the after show, I'm going to go over some of the stuff we went over before Savad got here about some of the upcoming changes to the class. So <clears throat> the less clear someone's motives are, the less apt we are to blame him, says Schlick. Maybe he was mad or drugged. If the motives are external to himself, say when he's compelled at the point of a gun to do something, we blame the compulsion and the man with the gun, not the actor. To say that if actions obey a regularity of natural law, then man cannot be said to be responsible for his actions, is to get everything completely backwards from the truth. To say, right? He's pointing out, you hold a man responsible when it makes sense that he's the one that chose the thing. That's all he thinks determinism means. It means that I know his character. He's the type of piece of shit that would steal something when you're not looking. The thing went missing. I caught him holding it later. Like, he's that kind of guy. He says, you need determinism for that. You need to believe that it's reasonable to say this sort of person in this sort of situation does this sort of thing. Therefore, I blame him. If he never would steal, but he got a virus and it made him insane and he stole things for a day and then he didn't know why he did it, you wouldn't blame him. You'd blame the disease, right? But the only way it makes sense to blame him ever is if you think knowing everything about his character would let you predict more about what he does. Knowing everything about his circumstances and his character might let you perfectly predict what he would do, right? You need to be able to do that in order for your blame talk to make any sense. We cannot prove determinism, he says. Lots, a, a lot of people have now pointed that out. That Paul, you never proved it. You didn't even try to. It's just sort of William James. It's just a faith position. And so is the opposite one. These are just, you can't really prove it. But then he says, but we always assume it. So he's, he's really trying to get you to embrace his kind of determinism, which is necessary for moral responsibility, not something like Paul Ray would say would abolish it. So he's going to say, we always think this way. This is just how we think. We assume that things would make sense if we knew more about them. That's all determinism really means. And we make predictions about the world and about the behaviors of others because that's the way we think. Ethics and moral law are about predicting that a man will act less often in a certain way if he receives punishment. And so it also presumes a regularity and predictability of behavior. The confusion that we are not morally responsible if we are determined is solely due to a language equivocation. The planets necessarily obey this law is not the same thing as uh, 
the psychological laws that govern what a person does, it is the same thing as that. The psychological laws that, that you would use to describe why a person of this character would act this way is exactly the same as saying the planets are forced to obey the law of gravity. Neither of those has anything to do with really forcing it to happen. The planets do what they want to do is just as true as the planets obey the law that they wish they didn't have to but are compelled to do. The law isn't that kind of law. In legal theory, laws say you will obey or we will punish you. They're trying to make you do something. It's a totally different use of the word law. We should invent a new word maybe, law one and law two, because we're confusing these two. And we think that if I have laws like this, I really have laws like this. If I have laws that say, oh, it makes sense in this sort of situation, you could expect this guy to act like this. Or if I knew everything about a person, I would really be able to predict what they're going to do. That kind of a law isn't a compulsion. It's a description. This is the kind of guy he is. And this is what you would expect him to do in this kind of a situation. That's just describing. It's not forcing. It's like a federal uh, FBI profiler or something, you know. Maybe if you have the right profile of your suspect or whatever, you could predict the behavior. And, you know, th there's some previous criteria. You can describe the suspect or something. But uh, but these are all very infallible systems, yeah. They're fallible because we don't know everything, says the determinist. But, but Schlick is making a new point. He's saying, you better hope that if you knew everything, it would all hold in. It would all work. And you could predict perfectly. Of course, we're far from that, but you better hope that's the case, or otherwise all your moral talk makes no sense. You need that to have morality, he says. It's not a threat to morality. You need it to make sense of talking about, hey, this is a guy. What a great character. Look how he acts. I bet he'll act heroically in the future. That's just the kind of guy he is. Hip, hip, hooray, for he's a jolly good fellow, right? None of that makes any sense unless his character predicts how he'll act in the future too. Otherwise, why would you say any of that? You just say, oh, accidentally he happened to do something good. Maybe tomorrow he'll eat a baby. I don't know why he does what he does. I can't make sense out of it. If that's the world you're living in, it doesn't make sense to say, be like this guy. Uh, you can trust a guy like that. None of that talk makes any sense unless you're predicting or partially predicting. Of course, you don't have all the factors, but you better hope that if you had all the factors, it would predict because that's what you're really presuming when you're making partial predictions off of bad of partial data. And, and that's Schlick's point. Schlick is saying, don't fear determinism. If you're a moralist, you should want it. You need it. You have it. You assume it. You better assume it because it's needed. All right. What, what a curveball. What a fun, crazy curveball to come in in the middle of all these essays we're reading where we're thinking like, oh, no, oh, no, determinism, free will. Uh, I want to make sense of the world, but I think I'm free. Right. Schlick is like, of course, they're tied together. You need that. The only reason you ever thought that they were a challenge to each other is that you thought, <laughs> it's so silly because the way we use language, you thought that when we said there's a law governing why a person's acting, that that was like making them do something. It's not that kind of law. It's a descriptor, like Mill said. It's not a prescriptor. It's a descriptor. Okay. On that note, we're going to end it and go to the after show where we'll talk more about these things and uh, it won't be recorded anymore. And then after we're done talking more about them, we'll go over the uh, housekeeping stuff and the cool new updates to the amazing things that are coming soon. So let's end this. Hey, this was really fun getting to figure out Schleck, right? We're, we're trying to understand it, right? I'm not saying he's right. We're just trying to understand it. And it's certainly interesting. So let's end there. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>